Großangriff auf Wien entwickelt sich mit unvorhergesehener Geschwindigkeit. Der versprochene Nachschub ist nicht eingetroffen. The battle for Vienna had lasted only a few days. The Red Army had conquered and occupied the city. At least in this part of the Thousand Year Reich, the war was finally over. The Soviet troops stood at the town of Korneburg, just a few kilometers north of Vienna. Gunter Bustin, the retired honorary doctor of the Technical University, lived here. Multiple but unsuccessful eye operations had turned the 66-year-old almost blind, which rendered his escape to Bad Aussee, his birthplace, impossible. By no means the former general building councillor of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy wanted to fall into the hands of the Russians. Shortly before the end of the war, design engineer Felix Wankel had important documents buried in the garden of his testing facility in Lindau on Lake Constance. Technical plans, construction drawings, and related notebooks should not fall into the hands of the Allies. A short time later, he fled from Lindau to his other house in Vorarlberg. When the French troops conquered Lindau, only a few executives were captured in Wankel's workshop. Ernst Heinkel's work lay in ruins. In 1945, the Heinkel aircraft factories that were scattered all over the Reich's territory were mostly destroyed. Whatever survived the Allied bombardments was dismantled and seized by the victors. Due to the denazification process, it took until 1950 before the famous aircraft manufacturer who produced thousands of aircraft for the German Air Force was able to start anew. In a subdivision of Mauthausen concentration camp in an old scythe factory in the Reichsgau Oberdonau, Victor Schauberger and five prisoners worked under SS custody on a supposed superweapon for the Nazis. After the SS had fled from the approaching enemy, Schauberger sent the prisoners home himself. He stayed behind, waiting for the American troops to arrive. At that time, if you wanted to work on inventions that required metal, you couldn't just go somewhere and buy it. You had to claim that it was essential for the war or used for military purposes. Hitler presented his party or his movement in his own words as very modern and affectionate in regards to technology. Therefore, many engineers saw Hitler in the NSDAP as their future. The period between the world wars was a phase of stagnation in Austria and Germany. There were only a few public investments and many of the inventors and engineers had to work with very little money. And suddenly a horn of plenty was opened, so that some people probably were more interested in pushing forward the realization of their theories than considering what their invention would ultimately be used for. During the First World War, Ernst Heinkel clearly realized that big money could only be made with the construction of military aircraft. It's quite regrettable, but that's how it was. He built bombers and fighters, but in the early 1920s and 1930s, he also delivered them to other countries.
auch an alle anderen Sender geliefert. Gunther Burstin, Felix Wankel, Ernst Heinkel und Victor Schauberger. The example of these men tells the story of how design engineers, technicians or visionaries became collaborators and accomplices of the National Socialists and, in the end, war profiteers. It all began in the first of the two great wars of the 20th century. When World War I began on July 28, 1914, after Austria and Hungary had declared war on Serbia, people were enthused by the war. They believed that it would soon be over. In World War I, the industrial nations that fought each other believed that the war would be over by Christmas. When it wasn't, they started to bring more and more soldiers to the front, but the numbers were balanced out so that nobody could gain an advantage. It wasn't about technology yet. The First World War wasn't a high-tech war, but it was the starting point for new technologies like airplanes, tanks or artillery. The forces were basically equalized. In the First World War, none of the nations stood out significantly and therefore had a big advantage. It was quite different in World War II. In World War I, they all started building better artillery. They improved their machine guns. Airplanes were introduced at the Western Front. It was a head-to-head -head race. The tanks that the Western Allies developed and used in large numbers in 1918 made a big difference, though, which was one of the reasons why Germany and Austria-Hungary lost the war. It's an irony of fate that it all could have turned out quite differently. Already in 1933, the Austrian Gunther Burstin, an officer in the think tank of the Imperial and Royal Railway and Telegraph Regiment in Trento, designed the first all-terrain armored vehicle with a rotating turret. He called it motorized cannon. Burstin sent his plans to the Austrian Army Command, but was met with skepticism. During peacetimes, they didn't see the purpose of a new weapon the Imperial Army ossified in the past couldn't see the magnitude of Burstyn's invention. Burstyn had submitted his plans to the Army High Command, but it was repudiated, so that neither the Chief of General Staff, Konrad von Hötzendorf, nor the Minister of War, Offenburg, ever heard of this submission. And in the end, his plans were assessed by an automobile consultant. This man only saw it from the automotive angle, calculated and then rejected it accordingly, claiming that such a vehicle wouldn't be needed. Basically, the armor and armament aspects, the combat options against artillery and the vehicle's off-road capability were not taken into account at all. Burstyn's invention was disregarded by the army, as the so-called motorized cannon couldn't be assigned to any of the current weapon types. In the Museum of Military History in Vienna, there is only a model that Burstyn built himself. As part of a special exhibition in 2011, a one-to-one -one scale model made of wood was also built, which can still be viewed today in the museum's tank collection. What can be said with certainty is that Burstyn's tank was ahead of its time. With his motorized cannon, Gunther Burstyn created a vehicle that is very similar to modern tanks. He combined armored protection, heavy armament, and an automotive element to a fast all-terrain vehicle that he called motorized cannon. It was a revolutionary invention, but it wasn't compatible to the warfare at that time. It was too fast for the infantry, too slow for the cavalry, so the generals didn't know how this vehicle could be integrated. That was the big tragedy. Burstyn tried to offer his proposal to the German Reich too, but even there his plans were rejected. 
the generals believed that this invention bore an increased risk of accidents since the driver of the motorized cannon had only very limited visibility. However, Burstyn's idea wasn't entirely new. He was inspired by various technologies that he skillfully combined into something new. His inventive talent was awakened in 1902 when he was transferred to Pula, the main naval port of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy at the time. There he was able to ride on a torpedo boat and was fascinated by its maneuverability and the speed with which this ship was traveling. So he felt that something similar should be built for his country an armed vehicle that was fast and maneuverable on land. In 1905, he saw the Austro-Daimler Straßenpanzerwagen at the Vienna Motor Show. In 1911, he created a model that he called Motorized Cannon, a precursor of today's tanks. His model had five pairs of wheels and two extensions in the front and back that were supposed to improve its off-road capability. These extensions should allow the vehicle to overcome trenches and obstacles. In 1911, Gunther Bursten applied for a patent for his invention under the number 53-248. When the war raged a few years later, neither Austria-Hungary nor the German Empire had any tanks. Only the National Socialists later appreciated Bursten's work in the field of tank forces. For the time being, the Allies had the trump card. The British and French were the first to use tanks in 1916. They had asked themselves how they could overcome the German positions in an offensive. On the Western Front, the Germans were on the defensive, with the exception of Verdun, where they actually attacked. Basically, they defended their positions until 1918 whereas the Western Allies tried to attack. They started their offensives as early as 1915 and kept getting a bloody nose. The engineering challenge of the Western Allies lay in the attack. How could they overcome the German trenches? So they came up with relatively primitive tanks, which they considered a possibility. The first tests weren't successful, the vehicles got stuck, the engines didn't work properly, but they stayed on track and the French in particular developed lighter tanks. It was a step-by-step -step process. The first real success was in November 1917 in Cambrai when tanks were used by the British. They conquered a lot of terrain but lost it again after a German counterattack. The British steel monsters weighing tons weren't able to break through the German lines in the long term, but they caused massive losses. It's interesting how the Germans reacted to this. At first they were shocked because they didn't know what a tank was. But then they realized that they could cope with them pretty well because the Allied tanks weren't very maneuverable in the field. So the Germans used artillery against them. By the end of the war, both sides had their own armored vehicles in varying numbers. The Germans hadn't yet recognized the superiority of the tanks as a weapon. In 1918, the Allies had thousands of tanks and the Germans only about 20, which was a determining factor in the Allied counteroffensive in August 1918. The Germans didn't have a chance of winning the war because they were inferior. They didn't have enough tanks or defensive weapons. In addition to armored vehicles, a third dimension of warfare became increasingly important in World War I, aerial warfare. In the beginning of the war, however, airplanes were mainly used for enemy reconnaissance. In the beginning, planes were used as a substitute for the cavalry for reconnaissance. In former times, classical reconnaissance meant that the cavalry rode out in order to scout the terrain, but this could be done much easier with airplanes. This was the first impetus. 
Nobody had thought about dropping bombs or fighter airplanes yet, but it all developed very quickly from 1915 over the years. Ernst Heinkel, born on the 24th of January 1888 in Grünbach in the Kingdom of Württemberg, began his studies in mechanical engineering at Stuttgart Technical University in the autumn semester of 1907. When he witnessed the Zeppelin accident of August 5, 1908 in Echterdingen near Stuttgart as a student, it became clear to him that aircraft were the future of aviation. He never graduated and neglected his studies more and more. In 1909, he started building his first own airplane that he took on its maiden flight in July 1911. He crashed when he tried the first turn and was seriously injured. These were his beginnings in the aviation business. Ernst Heinkel never flew again himself. He quit his studies and on October 1st, 1911, started working as a design engineer at the Luftverkehrsgesellschaft AG. In December of the following year, he joined Albatros Flugzeugwerke, where he developed his first own aircraft, a reconnaissance aircraft which was still in use during the First World War. In 1914, Ernst Heinkel started working as a plant director at Hansa und Brandenburgische Flugzeugwerke of the Austrian Ego Etrich, for whom he designed several seaplanes, including the flying boat Hansa Brandenburg CC and the Hansa Brandenburg KDW. But the peace treaties of 1919 ended the war and the aviation boom in Germany as well. A leading industrial nation is always also a leading nation in regards to the military because it has the respective engineers. Germany was forbidden to have any military aviation or shipbuilding. The winners of the war wanted to ban all these things in order to have a technical advantage in development and to permanently eliminate Germany as a military power. The conditions of the Treaty of Versailles brought technical development in Germany to a temporary standstill. From 1922, aircraft were built again on a small scale in Germany for civilian purposes only. Ernst Heinkel, who founded his own company, Ernst Heinkel Flugzeugwerke, in Rostock-Warnemünde in 1922, was a leader in this field. Heinkel. Heinkel is quite interesting because he was the first German aircraft manufacturer to develop the first military aircraft after the war, even during the total ban on aircraft construction. It's interesting that he developed this military aircraft following American orders on behalf of one of the winners of the war who banned military aircraft construction in Germany. Of course, this happened under wraps. It was claimed that the plane was built in Sweden. In 1921-22, a Swedish sister company was founded which served as a cover. But the planes were built at Kasperwerke in Travemünde, Germany, when Heinkel was still working there as a design engineer and afterwards in his own factory in Warnemünde. The whole enterprise happened in secrecy and was supported by everyone. Japan was an important customer too, even though Japan had been an opponent of Germany in the First World War. They wanted to use the technological advantages the Germans had developed. Heinkel built catapult-launched seaplanes for the Imperial Japanese Navy that were also installed as mail planes on the large passenger ships in civilian shipping. For Lufthansa, he designed their first commercial aircraft, the HE-70. The HE-70 was interesting because it was the first European fast passenger aircraft with retractable landing gear. It had its maiden flight in Warnemünde on the 10th anniversary of the company on December 1, 1932. Lufthansa had ordered the plane because in 1930, 1932, such fast passenger planes were developed in the USA and of course Lufthansa wanted to keep up. After the end of the war, forest ranger Viktor Schauberger made some observations. He was particularly interested in water and its properties. 
he observed trouts that seemed to stand still in flowing mountain streams. Schauberger came to the conclusion that nature provides driving forces whose existence isn't yet known. He learned to understand and use the flow behavior of water and the relationships between temperature and density. In the service of Prince Adolf von Schaumburg-Lippe in the Steuerling district, Schauberger technically implemented his observations in a wood alluvial plant where he made use of the forces that are inherent in concentric water vortices. Schauberger's wood alluvial plant didn't only work, but made it possible to bring in wood easily at a fraction of the previous costs. Das Holzschwemmen selbst ist eine alte Technik, die zum Beispiel schon Floating wood is an old technique that had already been practiced for decades, not to say centuries, in my grandfather's homeland in the Bohemian Forest. But the Schwarzenbergsche Schwemmkanal, where my grandfather's ancestors worked, was only intended for smaller trunks. Victor's invention doesn't arrange them in a trapezoidal channel as usual, but in a round channel. This means that there are no corners or edges where the water doesn't move, but the entire body of water takes the wood with it. He came up with the idea that he could create a water vortex. When it moves around the log, suction is created, which was the main principle of his wood floating systems. He was already a state approved expert for wood alluvial plants when he built a large wood alluvial plant in Neuberg Mürztal in 1925, which remained in operation until 1951. The slow rise of the NSDAP under Adolf Hitler began in 1920, and he was elected Reich Kanzler in 1933. Within a short time, he gained dictatorial power. Hitler, who rejected universities, professors, and established science, was able to autodidactically gain detailed knowledge and could always remember what he read, even in detail, and, if necessary, weave it into speeches, conversations, or monologues without any indication of source. His interest in esoteric topics made him receptive to new ideas, so numerous ideas and inventions were presented to the Führer. In one of these personal audiences, Hitler met a certain Felix Wankel. Felix Wankel was born in 1902 in Lahr in Baden and became involved in the NSDAP early on. He joined the party as early as 1922. He already showed great talent as a child, was blessed with extraordinary visual thinking, and showed great enthusiasm towards technology in general and combustion engines in particular. When he built a tricycle vehicle with a two-cylinder V engine with friends in 1924, he was so irritated by the shaking of the engine that he developed the idea of a rotary engine. He quit his apprenticeship as a bibliopole and set up a small workshop close to Heidelberg. He wanted to get rid of the valves in a reciprocating piston engine by introducing a rotary slight control for the gas change and realized early on that the sealing of the rotating parts was absolutely crucial.
Due to his enthusiasm for technology, Wankel also tried to establish a technical militaristic education in the Hitler Youth. The Austrian Leopold Pleichinger arranged a meeting with Hitler in the summer of 1928. Through Pleichinger, Wankel also came into contact with the entrepreneur and influential Nazi politician Wilhelm Kepler. In 1931, Wankel was promoted by the Baden Gauleiter Robert Wagner to Hitler Youth Gauleiter, but fell out with him politically and was expelled from the party. As a result, he founded the NSDAP spin-off Lager Notgemeinschaft. The Nazi seizure of power in Germany consolidated Wagner's position, and he had Wankel arrested in March 1933. While Wankel continued to work on his first rotary engine in Lahr prison, his friends tried to find advocates for him in the meantime. In September of 1933, Wilhelm Kepler obtained Wankel's release after he was able to persuade Hitler to send Wagner a personal telegram. As a leader in the Hitler Youth, he soon came into conflict with the Nazi regime at the time. But again, he had a supporter who financed his research and set up a test facility for him in Lindau. Wankel also became the co-developer of rotary slide engines for aircraft at BMW and other manufacturers. From 1933 on, Hitler began to secretly arm Germany again. The developments in aircraft or vehicle construction that were supposedly intended for civil use had a hidden agenda. After 1918, Germany was forced to disarm massively, but now Hitler prepared for a new war. Weapons research was given high priority. The newly developed weapons turned the Wehrmacht into a technically modern army. The Nazis generally presented themselves as a party with an affinity for technology and tried to give themselves a modern image. Among other things, Hitler was so successful because he managed to establish a real People's Party, the NSDAP, the only People's Party there was in Germany at that time. All other parties were clientele parties and he tried to address the common people, which he did with technical means. He made use of aircraft in his election campaigns and was therefore able to visit several campaign events in one day. And then there was also his propaganda machine, the cinema, the media. The NSDAP wasn't just a clientele party, it included all the people and seemed modern with all the automobiles and airplanes, which sparked a lot of hope. Engineers often only care for two questions, where can I put my technology to use and where do I get the resources for implementing it? On July 22, 1934, at the suggestion of an industrialist from Bremen, Victor Schauberger was also invited to the Reich Chancellery in Berlin to present his concepts and plans for water treatment and alternative energy generation to Hitler. Schauberger's developments in wood alluvial technology and the renaturalization of rivers had led him to the field of alternative energy generation. In the 1930s, he already filed a patent application for the conversion from one metal to another in the presence of hydrogen, which was supposed to produce free energy. This makes him one of the pioneers in the field of free energy or zero-point energy. Some people in the industry at that time were convinced that Viktor Schauberger's ideas were revolutionary and conveyed it to Adolf Hitler. Schauberger claims that he convinced the Führer of the validity of his ideas. 
But there are also written protocols saying that he was thrown out after a few minutes because Hitler didn't want to waste his time with a charlatan. For the time being, there was no direct cooperation with the National Socialist regime, but Schauberger found partners in the industrial circles who agreed to support his research. Among others, he worked together with Siemens. The Klimator, an apparatus that was built there according to Schauberger's specifications, melted at 4,000 degrees Celsius after it was activated and left unattended, whereupon Siemens ceased the tests. There is hardly any documentation of these tests. He was the first to use the force of swirling water and did very well in that field. But when he was given more money and responsibility, he tried to apply these principles to other concepts and systems. And the problem quickly arose that he lacked the scientific background that would have told him that things couldn't work like that. After the National Socialists had seized power in 1933, the pragmatic Ernst Heinkel became a member of the NSDAP. In the same year, Minister Goebbels visited Heinkel's plant in rostock warnemünde Heinkel was ordered to develop and manufacture combat aircraft for the new German Air Force, which was kept secret for the time being. The HE-111, a twin-engine bomber that was originally planned as a commercial aircraft, which Heinkel had developed in 1932, attracted special attention. In 1932, before the Nazis came to power, the Reich Minister of Transport gave the order to develop a twin-engine fast bomber that should also have a civilian variant. Whereas this airplane should follow the demands of a bomber, only about a dozen civilian HE-111s were built in comparison to 6,000 military machines. This dozen aircraft should be constructed in a way that allowed a fast conversion from the civilian into the military variant. In Oranienburg, near Berlin, a large construction plant was built in 1936-37, which was, during state visits, presented as a symbol of German industrial performance. Although the plant was called Ernst Heinkel Werke, it was owned by the German Air Force and only later taken over by Heinkel himself. The HE-111 that was built there and in Rostock became the standard bomber of the German Air Force. Today, only the old entrance hall reminds us of Plant 2 in Oranienburg. Despite frequent fights with various Nazi organizations, Ernst Heinkel was appointed Wehrwirtschaftsführer, head of defense economy, in 1937. The year 1938 didn't only mark the end of the Republic of Austria, which was now called Ostmark, it also became the fateful year for Gunter Bursten. He had already retired in 1934 at the age of 55 after only 32 years of service. Shortly before, he'd been appointed the honorary title of General Building Counselor. The reason for his early retirement was his steadily deteriorating vision. Burstyn struggled with the associated financial losses. He needed money and started dealing with various aspects of armored weapons again. He regularly sent ideas and suggestions to the commander of the German tank divisions, Lieutenant General Heinz Guderian. Guderian answered, Dear General Planning Counselor, I would like to thank you for sending me your various drafts. I discussed them with the Army Ordnance Office, but I wasn't informed about the further development of this issue. I apologize for not responding earlier, but due to my workload in the last few months, most of my private correspondence had to be left aside. With the beginning of the Second World War, Burstyn felt vindicated, but he was bitter. 
the German Wehrmacht used tanks as offensive weapons and achieved major successes. Bursten had foreseen it all with his motorized cannon. The Germans were focused on attack now. They had to wage the next war as some kind of blitzkrieg because, for economic reasons, they couldn't afford a war of attrition like the First World War. There was a big fight behind the scenes where Guderian and others finally prevailed after quite some time. Their idea was to use tanks as the decisive offensive weapon where tank divisions were used as some kind of spearheads. This surprised their opponents, not so much in regards to the quality of their tanks, but these new tactics. Bursten was inspired by the successes of German tanks. He devoted himself to tactical issues, anti-tank issues in particular, and developed various anti-tank barriers, which were also used in fortifications such as the Ostwall. Thanks to the intervention of his brother Walter, a highly respected technical engineer in Germany, Gunther Bursten was able to personally present his construction plans for his so-called Panzerfähre to the Führer. A Panzerfähre is an armored vehicle that is able to cross streams. To say it in layman terms, it's a tank that can swim. Hitler was taken with this concept and wanted to implement it right away with the help of the industry and his army command. But these plans were never effectuated, and Bursten only received an honorarium and the war merit cross with swords as a tribute. Three years later, Bursten received another recognition. Together with the aviation pioneer Igo Etrich and two other technical engineers from eastern Brandenburg, the retired general building councillor was awarded an honorary doctor's degree from the Vienna University of Technology. I believe that the appraisals he received from the Wehrmacht generals in the National Socialist regime were some sign of guilty conscience or sort of a fob off. They honored his innovations, but didn't appoint him a title as the creator of the Panzer Troops. He secluded himself and seemed disappointed. He was pleased that he was dragged in front of the curtain for a short while, but in the end, all he got was a honorarium and an honorary degree, which wasn't really much. On August 27, 1939, the world's first jet airplane took off from the Heinkel factory airport in Rostock Marien Ehe. Only three years earlier, Ernst Heinkel had come into contact with the young physicist Hans Joachim Papst von Ohain, who had been doing research on jet engines since 1933. Supported by Heinkel, who provided him with his test laboratory and production resources, Ohain and his team developed the HES-3, the world's first jet engine. At the same time, the HE-178, an aircraft tailored for the new engine, was built. Heinkel was always interested in fast aircraft and in developing new engines because his big competitor, Junkers, built both engines and airplanes, which Heinkel also wanted to achieve. He'd already tried to develop a steam engine for airplanes in 1928, but didn't get further than a prototype. He already knew he couldn't get into the piston engine business, but it was something different with the jet engine. This led to the first jet aircraft's maiden flight here in Rostock, Marienea, in 1939. Like other designers and inventors, Ernst Heinkel received several awards from the National Socialists. Among other prominent figures, he got the German National Prize for Art and Science, which was donated by Hitler himself. The first award that Heinkel received from Hitler was on his 50th birthday in January 1938, when he was awarded the title of Professor. Together with Willy Messerschmidt, he shared one of these national prizes. The other two prize winners were Ferdinand Porsche and Fritz Todt. 
The Reich Aviation Ministry wasn't too interested in the Heinkel jet engine at first due to its short range. In 1936, they formed a cooperation with Felix Wankel, who for this purpose founded the Wankel Test Facility in Lindau on Lake Constance. In addition to further developments on the rotary piston engine, Wankel brought the rotary slide control for aircraft engines into practical use. Until 1945, Wankel received millions of Reichsmark as support for his work from the Reich Aviation Ministry. Rotary slide control is simply an alternative to valve engines that are very laborious to operate with their camshaft bearings and so on. Rotary slide technology isn't necessarily an invention by Felix Wankel. It was already invented in the 1920s by other engineering pioneers. But due to his preparatory work on designing extremely tight rotary slide plates, he was able to conclude a consulting and research contract with the Nazis in order to make BMW's aircraft engines more powerful and less susceptible to faults. At Lake Constance, he also constructed a new type of boat that aroused the interest with the Naval Command and the Waffen-SS. He called it Zisch, and it was supposed to be very fast and unsinkable. He was able to convince people that he could also make speedboat engines more powerful with his rotary slide control, and that he would test them right on Lake Constance. That was probably one of the reasons why he could persuade the Nazis to provide him with such a choice object right on the shore. Meanwhile, Victor Schauberger had landed an agreement with Heinkel competitor Messerschmitt in Augsburg. In 1939, he announced that he had invented the so-called Repulsine, which he was to build at the Nazis' behest in Vienna, first at the Kempfer Company, then at Kernel. According to Schauberger, the device included all his findings and patents and was suitable for use as an aircraft or submarine engine. In 1942, the engine was destroyed at Messerschmitt during tests. The Repulsine was supposed to be a propulsion unit for an airplane or a submarine. At the heart of this apparatus were two fitting rotating discs that supposedly influence the space in front of the aircraft or under the submarine. Nobody really knows the specifics because there is no complete model of this apparatus. On April 20th, 1944, according to his own statement, Schauberger was referred from the Office of Technology in Linz to the Mauthausen concentration camp, where he was placed under the command of Camp Commander Franz Zierreis as a civilian employee. Here, he was supposed to continue his physical experiments without interruption. He was ordered to build engines for aircraft and submarines with the support of five suitable prisoners with an engineering background. In the concentration camp, he resumed his construction of his Repulsine, which he also called an implosion engine. The model of the Repulsine was built with the help of prisoners from the Mauthausen concentration camp. The team was first moved to Vienna and then in the spring of 1945 to Leonstein where a work diary by my grandfather notes on May 7th or 8th that the former prisoners were leaving for their homeland. They left behind a half-finished model of the Repulsine. War was over, and so was my grandfather's research. The only drawback is that we don't know how the Repulsine would have looked and worked in reality. The winners of the war had no inhibitions in regards to exploiting the inventors and design engineers who were supported by the Nazis. The Americans and Soviets kept a lookout for German scientists and designers. 
Their internment gave the impression that there was an immense and unexploited potential for weapons developments in Germany. Not only the National Socialists were promoters of innovative projects, it's a thumbprint of fundamentally totalitarian systems. In the Soviet Union, it was very similar. There was a rejuvenation of the science community in the loser states of the First World War, but also in the army. With the departure of the older generals or the older generation, many young people were approaching problems with completely different and new ideas. The impression may arise that especially dictatorships promoted science and new thinking, but all of this had its starting point after the end of the First World War. The end of National Socialism was also the temporary end of many inventors' careers. Burstyn committed suicide. Heinkel, Wankel, and Schauberger were banned from work and had to be denazified. But then it was time for a new beginning. After the loss of all his plants, Heinkel started anew in Stuttgart. Wankel continued working on his pistonless rotary engine in Lindau, which he only completed in 1954. Schauberger remained true to his experiments regarding free energy generation in Bad Ischl. The question of guilt or complicity no longer occupied anyone's mind after the war. These people were patriots. Heinkel first developed fighter planes, which are defensive weapons, but then Germany was at war with the other great powers from September the 3rd, 1939, and the question was, who will win this war? Everybody had bombers. Should an engineer say, no, we're not building that? When you're in a war, you try to win it. The Allied forces developed the Lancaster and the B-29 bombers, for example. Only in retrospect, they may have asked themselves what would come out of it. Maybe after they dropped the atom bomb, maybe not. Today, technical development and its use are based on a completely different system of values. Our way of dealing with weapons and war has changed. Nevertheless, even today there is no shortage of inventors and engineers for weapons manufacturers.